Yep, there I am. Hello. How's everyone this morning? Good. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start and give you a little update about Roger in case you don't have the email. I just want you, everybody, b to be informed about what's going on. Um, so he saw the doctor on Friday and was given a stern warning to make sure he takes what's happened to his body seriously. Um, be, well, it's Roger, so he could have easily just shrugged that off. Like, if you know him at all, you know that it'd be like, okay, I'm through it, I'm done. And that, but so he got a stern warning, which his doctor was very right to give him. Anyway, uh, he's been told that he needs to get exercising, and so he started walking three kilometers a day. Uh, he needs to start eating healthier, and um, I think that means less trips to McDonald's and such. So we'll see if he sticks to that without Denise there watching him. Um, he's also been told that he needs to slow down. So he's, uh, he's kind of like on hyperactivity all the time. That's just his personality. And running two churches, as you can imagine, there's always a lot to be done, especially during these times that we've been in the last few years. It's constantly changing um, rules and regulations that you need to stay ahead of. And he is just that person that's always trying to go the extra mile to reach somebody, and st which is, is great, and I think God will honor him for that. Um, but that being said, when he left the doctors, he shut his phone off. So, and he's been told that he's off work until April 11th. So we're just to respect that time that he needs to allow his body to rest and recuperate. Uh, when he comes back, I know he's still going to be full of vinegar. I'm not going to say the other part of that thing. He'll be a lively individual still. It's not going to change him that way, but hopefully he learns to take the downtime um, a little more seriously and things shift in his role to, to take care of his health. So that's the update on him. Um, so just continue to pray for him. They're monitoring his blood pressure and his hemoglobin and um, I don't know all the details of what his blood pressure is at. I know it was extremely high. And, but So just continue to keep him in your prayers that he um, does take it seriously. He does learn in this time off how to rest. He does see that there are people who are willing to step up and take things, and he can delegate and let that, that happen naturally. Um, and, and pray for the church that there are people who do do step up and use the gifts that God has given them to do what they can to help. And so that, you know, I think it's just good for all of us. Sometimes these things seem really scary, but in the end, they're really good for all of us. So let's just pray that that's the case this time. I also wanted to just, like, for one moment, um, just quickly touch on what's going on in the world. <laughs> I don't know, are you, are you like me? Do you watch the news regularly or not? You do. I typically do not, because it's just one sad, bad thing after another, and it's just not my thing. <laughs> that being said, I have found myself needing to be more informed with what's going on and have been watching more. So if you're like me, and you don't typically watch, and you have been tuning in, it's a lot. Lacey, would you get that for me, honey, please? Thank you. Um, it's a lot what's going on. And I hope that you do sense the urgency of how much it is and how important it is. And I do pray that you're seeing how it all ties into Scripture. I do hope that you're seeing... We are coming into the end times, or we are in the beginning of the end times. We can see how things are laid out. <laughs> and I pray that you sense the urgency enough to start sharing more, that we would be less anxious and more courageous in our sharing. So that's been really heavy on my heart this week, that like I know for myself, Jim, you and I talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago about not liking confrontation. <laughs> D 
different reasons sometimes. Like sometimes I just don't like how I respond to confrontation. And then I'm mad at myself after. But so I, I just don't like it. So a lot of times that has caused me to be quiet in sharing my faith. So my prayer going forward is that we just would not be afraid of that confrontation, that we would be bold and courageous, and that we would just trust and understand that when the time comes to share, to speak, that it's the Holy Spirit that will give us the words and speak through us. So as we come into this service today, I think it's utterly important that the time that we spend here, we truly spend plugging in. You know, our, we want our cups to overflow, so we need to fill here. We need to lift our praises to him here for, for the fact that what we're living through is no, nowhere near as difficult as what the rest of the world is or different places in the world are going through right now. So as we just start in this service this morning, can I encourage you to just really let's lean in, let's be filled, let's be ready to make bold statements to the world when we leave this building. If you stand with me. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for your word, Lord, and how it gives us direction to live our lives. Father, I am thankful that we have Jesus as an example. Lord, in your word, you tell us exactly how to live to lead people to you, Lord. And you tell us that all these things that are happening in the world are going to happen. But you tell us not to be afraid, to be courageous, that you go with us, Lord, that you are with us, you go ahead of us, you surround us, that you will be our provision, Lord, that you are our protector. So as we are in this service today, Lord, with full freedom to worship you, I pray that everybody would just open themselves up to you, Lord, to, to truly give praise for all the blessings that we have, Lord, and just to be open to hearing from you, to allow you to move freely, Lord, so that we can know and we can be ready to be used by you. So we give you all honor and glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. Not backing down from any giant. Because I know how the story ends. Yes, I know how the story ends. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for oh, the Victory. 
victory. I'm going to see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good.
Oh, you're on the move. Ho, oh. la 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 ho, oh. la 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 la. This is our revival anthem. Can you feel the darkness shaking? Ho, oh. we are the dry bones rising. This will be a great awakening. This is our revival anthem. Ho, oh. la 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 ho. Oh. La 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 This is our revival anthem Can you feel the darkness shaking? Oh, we are the dry bones rising This will be a great awakening This is our revival anthem Oh, la 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 Oh, la 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 This will be a great awakening this is our revival and that's good don't turn those pages yet i'm actually going to ask you to read that again after I, or sing it again after i read this um so last week if you were here you may have heard in our prayer f for ukraine that there was a prayer to uh, take the tracks off the, what are they called? How do I, tanks, thank you. Where'd that word just go on me? So I wanted to share something with you that I saw uh, is from a pastor, and I'm not going to say half these things right, Lviv, it's in Ukraine, so if I said it wrong, it's L-V-I-V. Anyways, so uh, this pastor who is in Lviv shared a post, and it said, Please tell your people, because of their prayers, God really fights our battles. The rockets disappeared in the air without reaching our homes. And no one knows where they go. Enemy tanks run out of fuel. Russian troops get lost and ask our locals for food and direction. That is definitely God, because we're dealing with the second strongest army in the world. So, if you didn't already know it before this moment, he's victorious. He's miraculous. He does the things. So, whatever it is in your life right now that you're needing something to break through on, this is our revival anthem. Can I hear you sing it? Can I hear it? Like, can you feel it? Can you believe it? Can you get charged up and ready for battle? It's time, people. We can't just be sitting still anymore. He's working. We're seeing it. We're seeing miraculous things. We're hearing about it. My goodness, if you're not fired up about that yet, I don't know what it's going to take. So we're going to sing it again. And Jim, I'm confident that they're going to be screaming along with you. Oh, la 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 ho. La 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 ho. La 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 ho. La 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 la. Spirit fall down, start a holy riot. Fill this place now with tongues of fire. Break the strongholds, come and leash heaven. Burn within us, make us bold as lions. This is our revival anthem. Can you feel the darkness shaking? Oh, we are the dry bones rising. This will be a great awakening. This is our revival anthem. Oh, la 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 la. La, 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 la. Fill our hearts, Lord, with a holy danger. Lead us beyond our fear of failure. We'll fight the good fight in your strength and power. We'll take back the night. Victory is ours. Let's go, church. 
This is a revival anthem, can you feel the darkness shaking? Oh, we are the dry bones rising. This will be a great awakening. This is our revival anthem. Oh, la 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 ho. La 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 la. We'll praise you when our hearts are breaking. Praise you when our world is caving. We will not, we will not be moved. We'll praise you till we see your kingdom. Greater things are surely coming. You are God. You are on the move. Oh, you're on the move. Oh, la 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 la. Oh, la 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 la. This is our revival anthem. Can you feel the darkness shaking? Oh, we are the dry bones rising. This will be a great awakening. This is our revival anthem. Oh. La 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 ho, la 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 la. This is our revival anthem. Can you feel the darkness shaking? Ho, oh, we are the dry bones rising. This will be a great awakening. This is our revival anthem. Ho, oh, la 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 ho. La 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 la. This will be a great awakening. This will be a rival anthem. Uh, ask if there's anyone who has any needs for us to pray for for this morning. As you know, we'll continue to pray for Roger. Um, is there anybody else that would want to? You're okay, we'll be praying for Art's brother Gerald with a sore throat. Well, you guys all got it together. There's nothing going on in anybody's lives. We're very lucky. I should have really heard you then. Right? How about unspoken ones? There's always those. Amen? Jim, I'm going to ask you to lead us. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning. Father God, with open hands and open hearts, Father God, because we know we serve a God who gives. Yeah. Lord, a God who loves and a God who wants nothing but the best for us, Father yes, God. Lord. So, Lord God, I just pray for every situation, yes. those that have been spoken out, those that are unspoken. Yes. Father God, we just ask you in the name of Jesus, because yes, of the cross, because, God, for you so loved us that you sent your son to die on that cross for every one of these situations, Lord. So we just lift them to you. We thank you, Father God. And, Lord... We thank you to hear the testimonies, Father God, as yes, they start Jesus. to come forward, Lord God, of the, your goodness and your greatness, Father God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. We're going to move into our praise or our worship part of the service now, so I just encourage you again just to lean in and, and take it all in. Amen. There's a name that levels mountains Carved out highways through the sea I've seen its power unravel battles Right in front of me There's a faith that stands defiant and Goliath to his knees. I've seen it praise unravel shackles right off my feet. 
That's the power of your name. Just a mention makes a way. Giants fall and strongholds break, and there's a healing. That's the power that I claim. It's the same that rolled the grave. There's a power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's a hope that calls out courage In the furnace unafraid The kind of daring expectation That every prayer I make Is on an empty grave That's the power of your name Just a mention makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there's a that's the power that I claim. It's the same that rolled the grave. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. Ready, church? Let's declare this. I see you taking ground. I see you press ahead. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's camp. You still do miracles. You'll do what you said. For you're the same God now as you always been. Let's repeat that. I see you taking ground. I see you press ahead. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's camp. You still do miracles. You'll do what you said, for you're the same God now as you always been. Your spirit's breaking out, your kingdom moving in, your victory claims the ground that the enemy had. You still do miracles, you'll do what you said, for you're the same God now as you always been. That's the power of your name. Just a mention makes a way. Giants fall and strongholds break and there's a healing. That's the power that I claim. It's the same that rolled the grave. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's clap to him this morning. Amen. There is no power, no power like the power of Jesus. Amen. You're more real than ground I'm standing on You're more real than the wind in my lungs Your thoughts define me You're inside me You're my reality I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. You're closer than the skin on my bones. You're closer than the song on my tongue. 
Your thoughts define me. You're inside me. You're my reality. I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. My heart is singing. Abba, I belong to you. You came running down my prodigal road. You came running with the ring and the rose. Grace is the collision on the way back home with the arms of a father who won't let I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, As we were singing that song, I was uh, holding my daughter Lacey in my arms, which is a little crazy because she's 10 years old, but as long as I can hold her, I'm going to hold her. But I was also reminded that my Heavenly Father holds me tight. I will never outgrow his arms, and he fights for us every day. He's our protector. Abba Father, amen. Thank you, worship team. I'm going to invite Chuck Price to come speak to us this morning. Thankful that the weather didn't keep you away from us. It tried, but thank God he had you and carried you here for us. Amen. The floor is yours, sir. Praise hallelujah. Amen, amen. What a crazy weekend. I love it. Glory to God. I was in such a rush to get out of the house and spent a day up in Ottawa. Just I got some grandkids there. That I love grandkids. They're, I would have had them first. Like they're, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it was good. 
and then actually I came down last night because I, I kept hearing about this freezing rain, and I'm thinking, okay, we'll just jump through that. But it turned out to be quite a lovely day. So it's all good. Amen, amen. So I forgot my preaching shoes. Forgot my preaching pants. Had to borrow a belt. You know how hard it is to find a 28-inch belt? <laughs> hey, Jim, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're good, buddy. So, anyway, thank God for some big folks in Prescott. Amen. So, it's all good. Amen, amen. Good to be with you. Our prayers with Pastor Roger. and I'm sure he'll come through this with flying colors. And uh, maybe God's trying to teach him something. Yeah. Maybe God tries to teach all of us something along the way. So, and we pay attention. To, uh, I think women listen quicker than men. Okay, ladies, I'm just throwing it out there. Okay, it's just, okay, I'll get at the word. Normally, I have a uh, top a uh, text. I don't today, and uh, an expositional where we just kind of pick a passage and hang there. But this is the word that God has been laying on my heart the last number of weeks, and I haven't been able to get away from it. And I'm not sure I want to. And it's just simply on the theme that Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. He's coming. I don't know where you stand theologically, and I, I don't argue with people anymore on when they believe he's coming back, you know, and uh, I, I, I believe in a rapture. I believe in a rapture. It's a word you can't find in the Bible, but you can sure find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of references to the church being caught up, uh, snatched away. You can find a whack of them. I don't know if that's a good word or not. A lot of them in Old Testament and New Testament that Jesus Christ is coming back. He is coming back. It's a matter of when, I guess, for some folks. So you can cross all your T's and dot all your I's, and that's not a bad thing. But when it boils down to it, this is where I live in these three statements that I want to deliver to you today and that you get in your own heart. Number one is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's number one. Christ died for our sins. Don't shout me down. I'm going to preach anyway. Hallelujah. He died for our sins. If that's not the case, we are in some trouble. Number two, Mark 16, 6. Mark 16, 6. He's risen. He's risen. Jesus Christ died, and he's risen. Number three, this is the one we're going to spend some time on today, is John 14, 3. Normally, you hear at a funeral service. This is not a funeral service. This is a glory service. Hallelujah. John 14, 3 says, I will come again. Now, there's three I's in that, and I'll come back to it in a minute on that John 14, 3. But I will come again. So let's just say those are the three things that you know as a constant. Do you think you're okay? Like, outside of all the other huff and fluff and what people are arguing about today and debating on theological issues, that Jesus Christ died, he rose again, and he's coming again. Really. Like, I could, I could, I guess I'm a simple Irish Welsh guy that I could just kind of live with that, that Jesus Christ, he died, he rose again, and he's coming again. So our salvation, it rests upon the first, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. If Jesus Christ didn't die for our sins, we have no salvation. No salvation. I could die for your sins, and we're both going to hell. I have a sin nature. You had a sin nature. We gave our life to Jesus Christ. I, I'm not sinless. I'm not sinless. There's times in my life where I've messed up. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God for forgiveness. This is not a guilt message today. That's not why I bring it to the house because we don't live under condemnation. Conviction is our friend. Conviction is our friend. I guarantee conviction has probably spared your bacon a few times. You call it mama's prayers or moral compass. I, I just think conviction, when every once in a while, just goes, stay home tonight, you shouldn't go. And you did, and you remember what happened to your friends that night. And so I thank God for that. I thank God for what he's doing today. We rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The resurrection is key to what we believe in. See, there's a lot of great leaders that have died for causes. Good men and good women. You may not like their cause, but they believed in something. My hat's off. They believed in something to the point that they were willing to lay down their life for their cause. I'm like, wow, 
wow, you're really committed. You're really committed. Go for it, right? Might not like the cause, but wow, go ahead. All right? But the issue is that there are good men, that, good ladies and good men that laid down a cause, but they never rose again. They never broke the powers of death and hell. There, there was no resurrection Sunday for them. That's what the difference is with Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ broke the powers of death. Every other leader out there every other is entombed, enshrined, and somewhere out there their, their body is still there. You know, Jesus Christ had a weekend rental. I'll give you a minute. I like you. He didn't need a tomb, but from Friday to Saturday, he wasn't planning on staying. And so it was just a weekend rental because Jesus Christ is alive. He's so much alive that he can sit beside his Father and pray for us and live inside of our hearts. He's so much God. So much God he can do that. And he's omnipresent on top of that. He's all-powerful and all-knowing. The devil is not. The devil understands human nature, but he's not all-knowing. He's not all powerful. You know what the devil does? Because he can't be everywhere at one time. So if the devil's in in Ontario today, then he can't be in Alberta. Thank you, Pastor. A few more of those would be great over the next hour and a half. Okay, good. Just, he cannot be, he's not omnipresent. If you think he's all knowing, all powerful, and omnipresent, you've just made him God. We serve a God that is all powerful, all knowing, and he can be everywhere at once. He's God. He's God. I love that fact. Okay, so Jesus Christ died, rose again, and he's coming back. He's all-powerful and all-knowing, so when he says, I'm coming back, you can bank on it. Like, he he really means it. He really, he wasn't just funning, right? He really means it. He is coming back, and I say, thank the Lord. So the doctrine of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is not something that should create fear inside of us as Christians, but we should get happy about it. Let me just skip over that word happy. We should get joyful about it. Uh, it, it's not a case of happy, happy, happy. You can lose your happy with a phone call. You can lose your happy, happy, happy with an email. If somebody cuts you off on the way out of the parking lot, you can lose your happy. Right? But it's not about your happy. It's about your joy. Why does the devil target your joy? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. So if he can target your joy, he can target your strength. And then we get wishy-washy and doubt steps in and fear steps in and all that junk that steps in over these last number of months in the church and outside the church. So we have this great doctrine that Jesus Christ is coming back. It should create faith. It should create a joy. It should create an excitement that one day, maybe soon, as I believe it, we're going to see Jesus Christ no longer through a dark glass, but we're going to see him as he is. Hallelujah. I can accept that. Church, I don't serve Jesus Christ because I'm afraid of going to hell. I feel like I've had a few days like that already in my 64 years, right? I'm not afraid. That's not why I serve Jesus Christ. I have a piece of the rock and a bit of fire insurance. That's not why I serve Jesus. I serve Jesus Christ. I love him. He laid down his life for me. He's preparing a place for me, and he's coming again. Hallelujah. I love that. I love that about Jesus Christ, that he cares about me to the utmost. And I say, thank God. So the night before his crucifixion, Jesus said to his disciples, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's those three eyes. Goes, we may as well drop the word if. You know, I will, I go prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am there, you may be also. So we have, that's called the rapture. Jesus Christ says, I will come again. I will come again. And we'll meet him in the air. The bride and the bridegroom will be reunited. There'll be a marriage supper of the Lamb. There'll be a, a banquet. There'll be a, a wedding. There'll be a glorious time. That just, that just follows tradition as we know it in New Testament, Hebrew tradition or Jewish tradition, where we've got this great banquet. We've got the marriage. The bride will come. The, meet Jesus in the air. Jesus will come back for his bride. And off we go to the Father's house. It just makes sense to me. This makes sense to me. I, I, I like that when I read the Word of God. You know, the disciples were so filled with sorrow when Jesus says that, that, that he's going to die, he's going to be killed, and, and he's gonna, they're going to have to do without him. But he's like, no, on the third day, on the third day, I'll rise again. Now, that, they sound, if they sound a little skeptical, it had never been done before. Okay, it had never been done before. A lot of guys say they got power, but Jesus actually showed up and did it. And I say, thank God. So Jesus tells them that. They're a little skeptical. We see that in their behavior in the Gospels. I get it. And so there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in their lives, but Jesus Christ kept his word. Church, I want to encourage you today in this crazy world of uncertainty. Church, there's one certainty that has not changed. Jesus Christ is coming. He is coming. That will put a smile on your kisser. Hallelujah. That Jesus Christ is coming. That hasn't changed. The economy will change. 
Okay, has changed, will change, fluctuate, right? bottom out, rise. It just, it just does that, right? World situations will change. The Word of God talks about that in the Word. But there's a certainty that Jesus Christ is coming. Hallelujah. And like John on the Isle of Patmos, we need to reach that point, you know, in the, as he's there, where he reaches a point in his life and says, listen, in Revelation 22, verse 12, Lord God, come quickly. Just come, just come quickly. And then he says, echoes it again in verse 20, where Jesus says, surely I come quickly. And so we need to reach that point in our lives. Father God, you know, I want to see you. Come, 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 come. So can I ask you, is there anything more important down here than you seeing Jesus Christ in the air? I know loved ones, I know family, uh, some are not saved, I get that. I'm an evangelist and I have family and, and, and I, I, my heart goes out. But one day Jesus Christ will come back. He will come back. He will come back on someone's 16th birthday. He will come back before someone gets married. He will come back before somebody graduates. He will come back before someone retires. He will. He will. So we're not going to run around our calendar around what Jesus is doing. Jesus has his hand on the doorknob of eternity and he's looking at his father going, I'd like to go get my church. I'd like to go get my church. It was never his intention to be away this long. Let me say it again to irritate some people. It had never been his intention to be away this long. You say, I thought there was a time. There is a time. There is a time. But the writer uh, of the epistles in, in, uh, uh, talks about how we can hasten and speed up the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, he actually thought we'd take the Great Commission seriously. He actually thought that we'd step in and get people saved and, and, and that the marriage supper of the Lamb would fill up because it's his will that none should perish and all should come to everlasting life. And he wants his house to be full. Wants his house to be full. I get that. I understand that. And I want to get that in your heart that you would believe it and stand with me on this. But I want you to know today the Word of God makes it very clear that Jesus Christ will come back. He will come back. He will come back. That's not up for discussion. It's really not up for discussion. Now, there are those that don't believe in a bodily return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I feel bad for them. I feel bad for them because the Scripture makes it very clear that he will come back. And let me just develop that for a moment. The Bible says he will come back. The Bible says, Chuck, that's kind of general. I'll break it down in a minute. The Bible says he will come back. And so we believe that. Listen, we can't believe the Bible without believing that Jesus will come again. You can't pick and choose. This is not a buffet. It's called the Word of God. It's the living Word of God. The truth is emphasized over and over again in the Bible. Many times, so many times, 17 of the Old Testament books speak of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1,845 verses in the Bible mention His return. Seven out of ten chapters allude, make some kind of reference to his return. One out of 30 verses in New Testament and on and on the list goes. 260 chapters in Old Testament have over 300 references. Over 300 references, some Old Testament to New Testament. I'm like, wow. But compare this. Paul mentions baptism 13 times. He mentions the return of Jesus Christ 50. 50. 50. I'm thinking, wow, Jesus might be onto something here. 23 out of the 27 New Testament books mention the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The return of Jesus Christ is referred to more than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The return is talked about more than the resurrection, and that's pretty significant in our lives. And I say, wow, for every prophecy that talks about his first coming, there are eight or nine that talk about his second. So when we look at what's going to take place in the years to come, here's my concern, church. we got people today that are so fascinated with the signs and the wonders of the time, they forget. Here, here's what we need to decide, not decide, what's the word? not distinguish, the gifts of the Spirit. Discern, thank you. Here's what we need to discern. Holy Spirit wants to help us with discernment, with discernment. See, I see good Christians fighting the signs of the time. So what we need to do is to decide whether they're God's signs. Matthew 24, 25, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. You know, we, we need to decide whether they're God or they're the devil. Like, I don't want to fight against the signs of the time when it's Jesus that's doing it. Like he said these things would happen. You're not going to be the first one to change prophecy. You're not going to be the first one to change history because biblical prophecy always, uh, biblical prophecy always becomes history. Right? Now, not all the prophets out there are biblical prophets. There's a lot of false prophets. The Bible talks about that in the last days. We need to understand that. The Word of God makes that very clear. And so I'm not looking for my information on Google. Thank you. 
I'm not looking for my information on Google. I have this book that I read every day, and it has great information. In fact, I plagiarize it all the time when I preach. I just take the Word of God and just regurgitate it and to bring it into people's hearts and lives. And I think that's what we need today. And so we've got verse after verse that talks about Jesus Christ will come back. The Bible makes it very clear. You know, it, it does matter what you believe. It does matter that you believe in the resurrection. It does matter that you believe that Jesus Christ is preparing a place for you, that where he is you will be also. It does matter. It does matter. But we've lost sight. And I don't want to fight against signs and wonders when it's God. Right? I'm, all, I'm all for fighting against principality and power and, and wickedness in high places. I'm all for that. I'm all for let's roll our sleeves up, get our armor on, sharpen up, and get the job done. But I'm not willing to fight against what God said would happen. I'm not willing to do it. I just think there's better energy spent where we just step in and say, okay, God, I'm discerning that this is what you're doing. And if it's of the devil, then let's kick his bottom. Like, let's, let's step up and do that. But it's not only Jesus that said he would come again, but the apostles taught it. Like the Word of God puts it, puts it out there, but the apostles taught it time and time and time again. And it's really important that we get into our own hearts and get into our own lives that Jesus Christ said, listen, I, I'm coming again, but the apostles talk about it time and time again. So it's not only Jesus. The apostles say, listen, here, and, and, and the angels too. That's pretty, that's pretty significant. Remember the day that Jesus Christ uh, ascended? The angels are there. The, the, some of the disciples are there. And they're whining and pouting. The angels look at them in Acts 1, verses 10 and 11, and say, the same Jesus that you see go away will come again. The same Jesus. The same Jesus. Let me emphasize that. The same Jesus. Not another Jesus. Not another Messiah. Not gases. Not Casper the friendly ghost. None of that. The same Jesus. The same Jesus that was brutalized and bloodied. The same Jesus that laid down his life but rose from the dead. The same Jesus that went up into heaven that day. The same Jesus. The angels say he's coming back. He's coming back. So that's pretty divine. That's not a preacher. That's not simply the apostles. But the word of God says it and the angels say it. Jesus Christ will come again and receive us unto himself. And I say thank God. There, and I want you to get that in your heart today. But it's sad, but there are many religions out there that don't believe in a personal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I also believe that Jesus will come again because of the many prophecies. It's been prophesied. And we're batting a thousand percent on the first. We ought to be batting a thousand on the second. The first advent has been totally fulfilled. You call it Christmas. Everything that was prophesied in Old Testament and in the Gospels, it's happened. Not one of them, you cannot stroke with that didn't happen, that didn't happen. Yeah, I didn't see that one. Everything that was prophesied has come to pass. So what happened the first time, it ought to happen the second time. When Jesus Christ comes back, and I say, thank God, lots of prophecy. It's Dr. Lewis Schaefer. He's pointed out that more than 300 separate prophecies have been identified which belong to his first coming. And that every one of them, without exception, was literally fulfilled. So here's Dr. Schaefer's conclusion. He concludes that since every one was fulfilled in the first, then we would understand that all will be fulfilled in the second also. That's just a simple conclusion. Don't need to be a doctor to figure that out. So allow me to draw your attention to just a few of the many claims that were fulfilled of his first coming. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. He was born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, not New Testament, 700 years before he came to the planet. He was born of a virgin. You can check that one off, literally fulfilled. Micah 5.2 predicted that he would be born in Bethlehem. Two for two? Hundreds of years before. Zechariah 9.9 foretold that he would ride a beast on Palm Sunday. Bam, it happened. Right. Isaiah 56 50, verse 6, predicted that he would be spit upon and scourged. Isaiah 53, a vivid portrayal of his suffering, rejection, and death. Psalm 69, 21, spoke of the fact that he would be given gall and vinegar. Psalm 22 speaks about the pain he went through. You can see his hands, his feet, the piercing of his sides, his garments being divided. It's mentioned that the lots were cast hundreds and hundreds of years before it even took place. So we're batting pretty good, church. And I just want to remind you, I don't know if I mentioned it more than 12 times already, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. We need to refocus. I hear about the great reset. I'm not so concerned about the great reset. I'm concerned about the great refocus for the church. That we refocus on those things that matter, that have eternal dividends that speak to our unsaved family and our saved family. And we've got lost in some of the other stuff. I'm not. I'm not going there. I can't live there. I'm driven to see people come to know Jesus Christ. 
I'm driven. It drives me. It keeps me awake at night. And Jesus Christ is coming back, and we need to get the house ready. And I say, Father, help us to do so. I know people are free choice. I know they can accept or reject. I get that. That's what love can do. You can accept it or not accept it. But I want to give everybody I meet the opportunity to reject Jesus. I want them to have to step over my faith, step over my body. I used to tell my kids that when they were teenagers. So you're going to walk away from God, you're going to step over my body. Not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm a preacher, because I want you in heaven with me. I made it awkward. I made it hard for my kids to, to follow the, the world. I made it hard. Man, when their friends would call in high school, I would make up stuff. Their friends would call. I'd say, sorry, Matthew, you can't come to the phone. He's lying on the floor speaking in tongues. Yeah, about the dance or about whatever. Sorry, can't come. Can't come. Got Bible study that night. Sorry, can't come. I, I would make it hard. I would make it hard. It was awkward the next day when they got to school. Hallelujah. But I had a lot of fun. Glory to God. I threatened more guys that my daughters were trying to date or they were trying to date my daughter. I threatened more guys. I, I threat. I mean, I threat. That's my baby girl. That's my baby girl. The guys come and go. Papas remain forever. All right. Well, not forever. I'm not Jesus, but I'm going to be around for a few more years. Hallelujah. Uh, I just, uh, that's family. That's blood. That's blood. So let's roll our sleeves up again and get busy in the things that matter, the things that have eternal dividends. Let's, let's get going again and not fall away and fall to the side. So we've got all these different things that God laid out and said, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. And it's not just me saying it. The angels say it. The scriptures say it. Prophecy says it. The apostles said it. And, and, and we're saying it today. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back again. I don't know when and I don't care. I'm not a date setter and neither should you. We've been through that. I remember the 1980s, was a guy wrote a book, uh, Why Jesus Christ is Coming Back in 1988. Well, we're still here. He made a lot of money and retired. Sold a lot of books, a lot of foolish people buying that stuff. The Bible says no man knows the hour. No man knows the day. That's not important about the day or the hour. The important is, are you ready? Are you ready that we live underneath that constant joy, not a burden, a blessing that we could see Jesus Christ at any moment? We're not here to set dates. If someone sets dates, they're not the Messiah. They're not Jesus. In fact, my Bible makes it very clear the next time you see Jesus, your feet ought to be off, ought to be, ought to be off the ground. The Word of God makes that very clear that we'll meet him in the air. We'll meet him in the air. Now, Jesus can do what he wants, but my Bible says we'll meet him in the air. So if there's no air under your feet and someone says, come meet the Messiah, he's in Morrisburg this weekend or he's in Cornwall this weekend, uh, pastor gives you permission just to slap them upside of their fat head. Hallelujah. Right? It cannot be the Messiah. It cannot be. It cannot be. Right? His feet will not touch the ground on the rapture. His feet will not touch the ground on the rapture. Some of you talk about the second coming as one deal. It's not. There's that revelation, there's the rapture and the revelation, right? And there's two different components to what we call the second coming with a time span between them. And so we will be caught up together to meet him in the air. And then we'll be with him in the Lord, right? We're going to have that marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Hallelujah. Good food. Come on, Christian. You love to eat. That's part of our MO. We love to eat, especially if you have the Pentecostal flavor. Come on, you'll never turn out a buffet in your life. Hallelujah. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. You know, the tribulation is talked about as a seven-year period. We have those, and they have good arguments on the pre, mid, post. There's also some others along the way, but those are the three main ones, that Jesus Christ will come back, and that will usher in the tribulation, the 70 weeks of Daniel, right, the seven years that we talk about. And so I kind of hang my hat there. Okay, there we are, the rapture. Now there are those that believe we have to go through three and a half years. And then it's called the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years. Like, if you want to stick around for three and a half years and go through the tribulation, knock yourself out. I'll leave you the keys to my truck. God bless you. It's paid for, and you can drive it around. Right? Have fun. If you want to go through the seven years of the tribulation, it's not much of a blessed hope if you have to go through the seven years of hell. Like, it's called a blessed hope. A blessed hope. If I have to go through 70 weeks or seven years of pain and anguish, and I got this Antichrist fella in the first three and a half years who's rising up going, peace, 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 peace. And then once he wins people's confidence at three and a half years, he starts to show his true, true colors. Starts to show his true colors. By that time, it's world dominance. The economy was held in his hands. You know what? I understand, and I know this may bother some of you, but the Antichrist will not come out of Canada. Thank you. 
I, I know some of you think he may be living east of here. Not true. Not true. Not going to happen. Listen, we've, they've had Nero listed. They've had Gates listed. They had uh, uh, Diefenbaker listed. They've had w Wimpra Ofri, or whatever her name is. They've had her listed. They, uh, knock it off. Daniel makes it very clear. Well, he'll come out of he'll come out of that European, the, uh, the ten horns, the European Commonwealth that will be set up. Uh, he makes it very clear that he's the little horn in all that mess. And so, church, the Antichrist is not a part of end times. He's a part of the tribulation. Before there's an Antichrist, there'll be an Antichrist system. We are coming into that Antichrist system now. It's in the air. It's in the economy. It's in the economy. We're not there yet. There's more to come. But Jesus Christ can come back. I get it. He's God. He can do what he wants. But we've got people today. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus. I'm looking for Jesus. The Antichrist has nothing to do with my life as a Christian. Neither does the mark of the beast. Okay, we're going to dance down that road. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So neither does the mark of the beast. It's not an, it's a, you can't take the mark of the beast by accident. We've got people today, you know, whether you have the shot or don't have the shot, I couldn't care less. Your freedom is more important to me. You know what? I want to travel. i got to get on a plane because I'm a missionary. i got work to do in Cuba. So they can poke me, jab me. I couldn't care less. The worst thing that could happen is I die and go to heaven. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's my story. You do your thing. That's fine. I honor your freedom because, listen, I work in communist countries where they have no freedom. So your freedom means the world to me means the world to me. But I'm not here to impose something. I'm not here to push that. I couldn't care less. That's not my issue. But you're not going to take the mark of the beast by accident. It's not going to be that way. It's not going to happen. The buying, the selling. Yeah, I get that. I get that. I don't care. I don't know if it's a 666 or the mark of the beast is a chip or a Frito or a Dorito or, or, or whatever it's going to be. I don't know. I couldn't care less. It's not a part of my future. The mark of the beast describes ownership, who you serve, who you worship. After all, that's one of the things the Antichrist wants the most, your worship, your worship. To bow down, Nebuchadnezzar, to bow down and worship me. Not a 90-foot statue in the plains of Durin, but just a man that will stand there and declare, I'm God, I am God, I am God. Listen, I've already made up my mind who I serve. That's not going to change. I'm not concerned about the mark of the beast. I'm concerned about the mark of the lamb. The mark of the lamb. The mark of the lamb. Jesus Christ that has stamped his image on you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of Jesus Christ. So you can dance down that road and people can create fear with all that stuff. I don't live there. It's not my future. My future is held in the hands of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So will all bedlam breaks loose down here. But listen, one of these days we're going home. That means some Christian bus drivers are going home. That means some Christian car drivers and truck drivers and train drivers and plane drivers and everybody else, they're going home. Right? What a mess it's going to be down here. What a, there's not enough kill switches, dead man switches on enough machinery out there. It's going to be a mess. Every hostel will be on redirect. There won't be enough blood. There will be a mess, a mess, a mess. That is not my future. You want to stick around, knock yourself out. I am going home to see the bride, They're the groom, and we'll be there together, and we'll celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb and the wedding, and then after we're judged, there's a judgment seat of Christ. You've heard about it? Humans are judged at either one of two. There are other judgments that are talked. Israel will be judged. The Jewish nation will be judged. Angels, will be, the fallen angels will be judged. Nothing to do with me. You're either going to stand at one of two judgments. You're either going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. The Bema seat. You know what the Bema seat is? It's back to the Olympic days of Corinth. When you, ran, run your, when you ran your race and you won, you would go to the Bema seat, the judge's reward table. And in front of all the clapping crowd in, in the stadiums of Corinth, you would walk forward and they would put that reward around you or in your hand, and that was the Bema seat. That's what you and I have to look forward to. We are going to home to see Jesus Christ. It's a rewards dinner. It's a reward banquet, yes, and all our actions as a Christian will be judged by fire. I'm okay with that. It's all right. You will not be judged from things before you were a child of God. This is not a judgment of Christianity. Your, your salvation is not in danger. It is not in danger. It is not in danger. That's a whole other judgment. There's that, that, the white throne judgment of God, which takes place at a later time, a later time, a much later time, where if you're in that lineup, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. Uh, there's no questions. The books will be open. It's, it's funny. It's not funny, but it's an interesting study that our, as Christians, our works are judged by fire. 
are judged by fire. Our works are judged by fire, right? And, 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 the, and the apostle talks about the six things that are thrown in there. There's wood, hay, and stubble, and then there's precious, uh, precious diamonds, precious sil silver and gold, right? So you've got things that are combustible and things that are not. Three that will burn, things that won't. And they'll go in the fire, and your reward is what comes out. I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. But to stand before God at the judge at the uh, white throne judgment, you know what? It's not you're not judged by fire. You're judged by the books being opened, and things are recorded. Things are recorded. Things are recorded. And then there's one book that's opened after all of that. That's the book of life. But what? Not one name at that judgment will be found in there. Won't be found. It's too late. It's done. It's over. So the best way I know to not to go to hell is don't find yourself in the lineup for the great white throne judgment. You're in the wrong lineup, Mama, Dad. Hell was never prepared for you. You can't find me a verse in the Bible that says I've gone to prepare a place for you called hell. But you can find scripture, I've gone to prepare a place for you, that where you are, I am, I am, you are, and it's going to be my father's house. Those are pretty potent scriptures. Like hell, hell is not made, made for the fallen angels. It's made for the, the, the uh, antichrist. It's made for the false prophet. It's, made for, it's made, uh, made for all them lads, but it's not made for us. If you find yourself in hell, you are unwelcomed and uninvited. It's not our sins that are sending us to hell. It's our unbelief. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. If I believe in that, which I do and I did and I do, then I believe my sins are under the blood. So on that day of judgment for me, the blood will speak for me. The blood will speak for me. There will be no blood covering at the other judgment. There will be no forgiveness because it wasn't part of the earth down here. It wasn't there. And so I'm just warning and telling people we need to get ready because Jesus Christ is coming back. And I'm afraid the church is off kilter. We've lost sight. We've, we're, we've strayed and we're fighting and fuming over a bunch of stuff that has no eternal dividends. And it's time we as children of God got back up and settled the issue and get a hold of God's word and stand. If the church doesn't have faith, the world will never have faith. If the church is walking in doubt and fear and coulda, shoulda, woulda, and the world picks up on that, what do we have to offer them? What do we have to offer them? But we have a confidence, we have a sure hope in Jesus Christ that he is preparing a place for us. He will come again. Hallelujah. He will come again. We'll meet him in the air. Come on, don't get excited. Let me do that for you. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah. And after that seven-year period, seven, you can argue with me all you want on this one. But one thing I do know, Bubba, one thing I do know, disagree with me on any, any point, but you cannot disagree with me on this one. The rapture is only for Christians. You can argue with me when, pre, mid, post. I'd like to start a new one called pan. It'll all pan out in the end. Don't worry about it. I am worried about it. Then we're going to come back, church. It's called the second coming. Second coming. In the clouds is the rapture and the revelation. We're going to come back. We're going to come back on horses. We're going to be dressed in fine linen. Doesn't sound like much for battle gear, does it? I feel like I'm wearing a tablecloth. Back we come. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. It'll be so fierce the battle will flow for 1,600 furlongs, about 180 miles. It'll flow to the horse's bridle. You never have to fear nuclear. Let me throw that in there too. It's free. You never have to fear nuclear. God's bigger than some maniac who can push a red button. Let me say it again. Our God is bigger than some maniac who can push a red button. He's bigger. He's bigger. I believe that with all my heart. I believe it for my kids. And I believe it for my grandbabies that the world that I'll leave them is still in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is still in control. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We'll come back. And after that, ushers in the millennial period. It's a thousand years of peace. A thousand years of peace. There are those that believe that we're in that now. I'm like, what book are you reading? Seriously. I, I have preacher friends that believe we're in the millennial now. Millennium now. A thousand years of peace. So here's what I tell them. Because there's a thousand years of peace where the lion will lie down with the lamb. So here's what I tell them. So now, today, tomorrow, get a lion, get a lamb, throw, it, throw them in a room and see who comes out. I guarantee it won't be the lamb. 
for the millennial period, there'll be a thousand years of peace. A thousand years of peace. A thousand years of peace. Wow. You want to know peace? It's found in a person. Peace is found in a person. Not a quiet night when the kids go to bed because they get up in the morning. Got to get away. I understand that. Got yourself a little cottage away from all the hubbub. It's a, you got a boat in. I know. I get that. I understand that. I had a friend like that. Loved it. Worked all week and then got in his boat and went into his boat cottage. Someone stole his boat. He can't get to his cottage anymore. <laughs> Where did his peace go? It's more than a cup of tea at 10 o'clock at night. See, we'll never have peace on earth because we keep denying the Prince of Peace. We keep denying. We don't, we don't welcome him. We don't usher him into our schools. We don't usher him into our UN meetings. We don't usher him into our government meetings. It's the Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. It's attached to a person, the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God. I don't know whether you're di try or I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I like that because I feel I kept all, all three busy for a lot of years. And now today, I celebrate them in my heart and my life. Again, you can argue with me. It's not an issue with me. I'm just telling you, church, Jesus Christ is coming back. He is coming back. I choose with my limited knowledge and study that Jesus Christ will come back before the tribulation. If you want to stick around, like I said, knock yourself out. Go three and a half, go seven. I don't see how the seven fits in because when the church is raptured, the church is raptured, we're caught up, we go to Jesus, we go to the Father's house, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? there's the judgment seat of Christ, and if we're, if we're just going up to come back again for the second coming, like the marriage supper of the Lamb would have to be a takeout meal. You'd have to learn how to ride a horse real fast, get changed because you, you got stuff you got to put on, and then we're back again. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. There's a whole lot of stuff that fits in, has to fit in somewhere. What doesn't fit in anywhere in time category is the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That it could be today. It could be tomorrow. You say, Chuck, I've heard this all my life. Yeah, me too. My father preached it. My mama preached it. My Irish grandfather preached it. Circuit writer, great-great-grandfather, he preached it. And they're all come and gone. I have more of a right to preach it today because I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is coming back. Let me close it out with this. I'm only going to close a couple of times. Thank you. Here's where I want to go with you today. This is my heart. This is what keeps me awake at night. That we would get ready for the return of Jesus Christ. I know I'm talking to Christians. Our business, our readiness, our lifestyle must speak of the soon return of Jesus Christ. That we would have an end day, last day strategy. The Bible says in the last days these things, will, perilous times will come. Right? The writer says mark these things, note these things. Mark it. These things will take place. 2 Timothy chapter 3 speaks about how behavior will change. Lovers of themselves. Right? Whole list of ugly stuff that will take place. Behavior will change. 2 Timothy chapter, 2, 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about scoffers will come in the last days. And they'll scoff because they don't want to believe their own lies. They want to take their own truths and develop them into their own truths even though they're their own lies. They absolutely forget the things that they've learned to push forward their mandate. When you close out that chapter, it says something like this, that Jesus Christ didn't forget us. He's patient unto salvation. He's patient unto salvation. That Jesus Christ is not waiting, 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 waiting. He's patient because he understands that his patience works towards salvation. That's where we, the church, step in again and promote the gospel and pr ask people, are you ready? Are you ready? I hear people talk about a bucket list. I don't have a bucket list. I've lived longer than I thought I was going to. It's been a great joy, right? It's all good. Broken the records on the price side. All good. Not that I don't want to live long, but I wouldn't mind living healthy until I see him face to face. I don't have a bucket list, but what I do have is a spiritual bucket list. You may want to go to the Grand Canyon. I've been there. It's just a big hole. Real big. Maybe that's on your bucket list. You may want to, you know, 
I'm pretty well traveled, been there, done that, got the T-shirt. It's been good. It's been good. But I have a spiritual bucket list of things that I'd like to see, things I'd like to see in the last days where God said he'd pour his spirit upon all flesh and our sons and our daughters would prophesy. And upon our handmaidens, says the Lord, and upon our young men and our old men, dreams and visions. I'd like to live long enough to see an end time outpouring of the Holy Ghost that's also talked about in the perilous times in the last days. I've reached the conclusion, and if I'm wrong, don't correct me because I'm having a lot of fun with it. Only God, only Jesus can make the difference right now. There's not a committee, an organization, a government that can make changes we need. It's got to be Jesus. It's got to be Jesus. Church, it's got to be Jesus. I know we know that, but we need to start acting on it. Acting on it. Faith is an action word. It's not simply something you believe. Faith is an action word. So I just say we get busy about the Father's work while it's still daytime because the night's coming when no man's going to work and the door will be shut. It's shut in Old Testament with Noah. It'll shut once again when Jesus Christ comes back. Can people get saved during the tribulation? I think so. But here's my deal on that. If you can't live for Jesus Christ now with the influence of the church, with the influence of your prayer, of your family, the influence of Holy Spirit, some of you may believe he's going to stick around. I personally don't. When the church goes, figure he wants to catch up and get on with life too. If you can't live for Jesus Christ now with all that going for you, how in the world do you think you're going to live for Jesus Christ during the tribulation? Will you be martyred? Yeah. Yeah, because you can't take the mark. Can't buy, can't sell. It's not just about that. It's about you don't want to take it because it just speaks about ownership. 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 Church, what's still left on your spiritual bucket list? See, what God called you to do when you were 15, it's still on the table. You, you thought it changed because you decided to go another way, you know, raise a family, get a trade, more power to you. Appreciate that. But the deal's still on the table. God didn't change his mind because you went, the deal's still on the table. That's the kind of bucket list I'm, that when I stand before God, at least, at least I can hold my head up a little bit other than his glory, I, and square my shoulders and go, Father, it's been great to serve you. I've done my best. Will I hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I remember when Billy Graham was asked that in an interview one day, would he, would he look forward to hearing that? He goes, I don't think that'll happen. I won't get came out of my chair. I thought, well, Billy Graham's not going to. It's not about that. It's not a carte blanche where we're just, oh, well done, thou great and faithful servant. Really? Really, what are we doing for Jesus Christ that matters? What are we doing for Jesus Christ that matters? Here, here's how I want to pray about it today. May we love him. May we live for him. May we labor for him. And may we look for him more than we have. I know the four would preach on their own. I get that. Message within a message. Again, here's my prayer for us. May we love him, live for him, labor for him, and look for him. Jesus is coming. I might have mentioned that a few times. Jesus is coming. Let's refocus, church. Let's refocus on the things that God thinks are important. Seriously what Jesus thinks are important, not what Chuck Price thinks are important, or even yourself, what is in God's eternal timetable. Fair enough? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, take these simple thoughts today and apply it to where we live. Don't let us get away with lazy. Don't let us get away with fear and doubt. May we step up and be what God wants us to be. It's not about doing stuff. It's about being what God's called us to be. I pray, Father, we take a long look inside of our hearts and our lives today. And if there's something yet unfulfilled and God asked us to do it, let's get her done. Get her done. I pray that, Father. 
that the deal's still on the table, and we'd act on it. We would act on it. I pray that today. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our lives. Take our lives. Use us to make a difference in someone's eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, church.